Yeah, so one of the things to understand about this is that um, is, is that probably, judging from previous pandemics, maybe 40% of Americans will be infected with this, maybe less, maybe 10 or 20%, maybe up to 60%. With the 1957 pandemic, ultimately about 40% of Americans were infected. And, um, and, and, but, but it comes in waves. So you, we're hit by the first pulse of it. Typically in the summer, for a combination of reasons, including that human beings go outside, we're not as densely packed, maybe the, the ventilation outside reduces the transmission of the, the pathogen, maybe the heat or the humidity play a role in reducing the transmissibility of the pathogen. So our behavior changes, the biology of the pathogen is such that the temperature and humidity affect it, transmission tends to decline. But then the virus has gone to the Southern hemisphere where it's winter there during our summer, and then when we return to work and school in September, it comes back. This is a very typical scenario. So unfortunately, it's likely, not certain, and I need to again emphasize that everything I'm telling you today is based on the best available knowledge to the best of my knowledge. It's possible that a year from now, people will watch this video and, and think I was right about this and wrong about that. And that's just the knowledge we have now. This pathogen's only been with us for um, three months. I mean, it just, it started, we think, in mid-December in, in Wuhan, and uh, it started spreading around the world in mid-January. It was already in Seattle by mid-January, we know from genetic analyses, and then was sort of spreading. And now here we are, March 18th, you know, two months after mid-January. That's a, not a lot of time for scientists to figure out what's going on. So anyway, um, so we think it'll spend the summer mostly in the, in the Southern Hemisphere, although we'll have some cases, and then it'll come back in the fall. And in the 1918 pandemic, the second wave was deadlier than the first wave. So in 1957, that wasn't as much the case. So we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but then there'll probably be a second, maybe a third wave, and eventually, basically, we'll get used to it, and it'll just sort of be there all the time. So since you mentioned Seattle and we're talking about weather, so Seattle, it sounds like they've got a, a strange situation or a more severe situation going on there, perhaps. It's also, it also rains a lot there. I'm here in SoCal where it's sunny, you know, yeah. sunny and 70 every day, it, although it has been raining the last week. I mean, could that alone, just the, the weather patterns like that affect any of this? Well, the Chinese scientists have done some research on this. We don't know is the answer to that question. People hope there are hints at multiple directions. I do not think we're gonna have a complete weather cure. That is to say, I don't think the disease is simply gonna disappear because of the weather. The evidence is conflicting. If I had to guess, I would say that probably we'll get some reduction in cases from the warmth and the humidity, but it's hard to know what. The, the Chinese did some analyses because their country is so large where they looked at transmission all throughout China and in some parts of China, it was hot, and some parts cold, and some parts humid, and some parts not. And they kind of looked and saw where was transmission the worst. And it seems like optimal transmission is at around 40 degrees Fahrenheit on average daily temperature. So cold. But so when you get much colder, much hotter, that seems to be better, less transmission, but not zero. And then they looked at humidity, and it looks like very dry weather is bad. So if humidity is less than 5%, that's not uh, particularly good. But if you look at weather patterns for where the virus has struck, so far it seems that countries closer to the equator seem to be doing better. Um, so it's a mixed picture. I don't know the answer, but if I had to guess, I do not think, I think the weather will make some difference, but I don't think it'll be a, you know, a definitive difference. So I think I'm actually gonna skip the next one in the thread because you were talking about uh, vulnerable groups. But since you're talking about, because I think we've sort of hit that already, unless there's anything else you wanna add about older people or sick people. Well, I think yeah, I mean, I think we have to be mindful of people on dialysis, people with chronic illnesses, institutionalized people, um, the elderly, homeless populations. And one of the things that's really important to understand about a pandemic is that it's the great equalizer. We're all in this together. Actually, the reason you should care about, let's say, the homeless or people who are chronically ill is not just because you should be kind and compassionate and altruistic. It's actually your own selfish interest, too, because we do not want populations that are reservoirs of this pathogen. We, we want to take care of everybody so we all can be safer. This is why social distancing, even if when you practice social distancing, you're actually showing kindness to others. One of the ironies is that people think, oh, I, I'm going to be brave and, and show 
kindness by shaking people's hands and being out and about. Ironically, that's not the kind thing to do. The kind thing to do is to remove yourself from circulation so that you're not circulating the pathogen. That's the best thing you can do for your, your group or your society. Yeah, I actually didn't mean to diminish any of those groups, but because you were hitting on the China part, which was the next tweet, I, I was gonna jump over that. So you, no, you no, actually, in the thread, you called it. you were. No, I know, I know. I wasn't suggesting, I was just saying, I was taking advantage of the opening to point out to people in case it wasn't obvious, why it's not just a question of compassion, it's it's actually in our self-interest to take care of these populations. So you talked a little bit about China. You know, we live in this time where it's like half the people are saying China unleashed this on the world, half the people are saying China has done nothing wrong. Um, you called in your Twitter thread, you called China's response astonishing. Can you explain that? Well, first of all, we, we know, uh, we would know from genetic analyses if this was an engineered uh, weapon and uh, that's a conspiracy theory. There's absolutely no evidence that any such thing happened. Okay. And uh, so I, they certainly didn't release it deliberately and, um, and because they're killing their own people and because of the study. So that's ridiculous. Uh, no, what I was describing is China, because of its totalitarian or authoritarian rather government and its collectivist culture, was able to put 930 million people under a kind of home-based quarantine beginning January the 25th for like eight weeks. It never in the history of public health has such, so many people been under such restriction for so long, to my knowledge. It's unbelievable what they were able to do because of their culture and, the, and their government. And I call this a social nuclear weapon because it gives you a sense of what they were fighting. You know, the power of this pathogen that they were confronting, that they resorted to this. China did not decide to do this for fun. And what I was trying to communicate with that thread that was now weeks ago was to try to get attention in the United States, like, look what's happening in China. This this is not going to just stay there. This is not like a Chinese problem that's, you know, they've decided to put a billion people under home arrest, you know, for two months for fun. We need to prepare. We need to think about this because the virus is going to reach our shores. In fact, already when I was writing that, it had reached our shores. This is what happens in pandemics. No matter where the disease starts, it spreads around the globe. And by the time you're aware of it, even if you're aware of it 30 days after inception, it's too late. Given movements of people, even frankly, 100 years ago, given movements of people on, on, on steamboats and on, on trains and, and big compact cities, the virus spreads. So... Uh, so anyway, so I was, you know, I was trying to describe what the Chinese had done and, and it is astonishing uh, what they did. And they have brought down their cases in a country of 1.4 billion people to, you know, under, under now it's like, under, I don't even know, it's like 10 cases a day or something in the whole nation. Yeah. So this is unfortunately what we are facing in our country. And we have different strengths and different weaknesses compared to China. One of their weaknesses, we have an open a commitment to free and open expression in our society. And in China, unfortunately, the doctor who first tried to sound the alarm, Dr. Wen Liang Li, um, he was brought in on charges of rumor mongering. You know, he was he was uh, basically using the Facebook equivalent in China and messaging his friends and saying, oh my God, I'm seeing all these patients in the hospital with this particular kind of pneumonia. I'm worried we have a new pathogen. And the local authorities called him in and, you know, accused him of rumor mongering, which is not something it's not a crime in our society. So, not yet. Um, no. So, I mean, so our strengths in our society include our wealth, our, our openness, our, our tremendous scientists, but we haven't been playing to those strengths. We've not been listening to our scientists. Uh, we've not been deploying our wealth. We, we haven't been acting the way we should be acting and taking our strengths to cope with this. And, the, you know, the Chinese use different strengths and they frankly, coped very effectively with this. I should say, just to be clear, what the, the Chinese had accomplished was they stopped the spread of the pathogen, but they did not eradicate it. So the pathogen is still there, and it will come back, even to China, as it will come back to us. But they have bought themselves a huge amount of time to organize their response now so they don't lose, you know, countless lives. Okay, so actually, I think most of the other things in the thread you, you've already hit. So I'll only ask you one more, and then I just want to do two or three audience questions real quick. Uh, you mentioned the okay. nineteen. You mentioned the nineteen fifty seven flu pandemic before. 
Uh, can you talk about some of the similarities and differences to what we're dealing with yeah. now? Well, 57, 1918, of course, was the big one. Uh, that was the so-called Spanish flu, which um, swept the world, uh, you know, killed many millions of people, including our country. It was a different time, of course. Uh, people were, were starving because of the war. There was a lot of uh, disruption because of the war. Um, and um, it was a different pathogen. And, uh, you know, many, and there was no modern medicine, uh, no antibiotics even against bacteria. And many people in that, we think, many of those people died uh, not just because of the viral infection, but then their lungs got so-called super infected with bacterial pneumonia, which killed them, many people. So a lot was different then. Uh, and we, earlier we talked about how the, it came in three waves and, you know, it was awful. And there was a Great Depression, of course, afterwards as well. So I don't think, around the same time, it, anyway, I don't think... Um, I don't think that this pandemic is thankfully going to be that bad. But the nearest analog I can see, even though it was a different pathogen and in some ways had different epidemiology, for example, in 1957, the pathogen also killed young people, whereas this one does not, um, I think 57 might be a good model for what we're facing. So every 10 years or so, at uh, reliably but at an unpredictable time, the world has a pandemic. Most of your listeners will remember SARS or H1N1 or MERS, and those have petered out. So people weren't taking them, they don't take them seriously. And they peter out for a variety of reasons. Ironically, one of the reasons is that sometimes they're too deadly. For instance, SARS was about 10 times as deadly uh, as, the, as the COVID that we're facing now. And when a disease is too deadly, it kills its victim too fast, so the person can't spread it. So this particular pathogen we're facing has sort of middling level lethality. It's neither too benign not, nor too deadly. It's not as deadly as the 1918 virus. And it has middling level transmissibility. It's not very difficult to transmit and it's not too hard to transmit. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of in the middle there. And in my view, it, it seems to be behaving similar to the 57 pandemic, which to be clear, some of your listeners, older ones may remember it, but many people won't. And, and part of the reason people don't remember it is we didn't have the same media environment then. And of course, people were dealing with polio and other deadly diseases. But that pandemic swept over the United States and killed, we think, about 110,000 people, which back then was half as deadly as all of the cancer in the United States. Mm. So today, if we have a 57 pandemic, we're talking hundreds of thousands of Americans dying from COVID if the disease is half as deadly as cancer, so as a group. So it's serious, it could be quite serious. I also wanna just take an opportunity again to say, we don't know exactly what's gonna happen. And what's very important for your listeners is to understand that despite political polarization, and despite our desire to simplify our choices, should we have Rice Krispies or should we have Corn Flakes, there are shades of gray and there's nuance when it comes to serious policy dilemmas and, and serious scientific questions. So there's a range of outcomes we could observe in the United States from this. We don't know exactly what's going to happen, but at best, 35,000 Americans are going to die, in my view, at best. And it's quite possible that 20% of Americans will get infected, that's 60 million Americans in the next year, and our best estimate is that half a percent of those people might die. That's 300,000 Americans dying in the next year of this condition. And that's possible. It, we're not sure it's gonna happen. It might not happen. I hope it doesn't happen, but it's possible. And that is a very, very heavy burden. Uh, that is about, that's 1957 uh, pandemic. You know, That's half as deadly as cancer approximately. So, so that's why everyone is taking it seriously. 